Hello, and welcome to The Amber Stitt Show. I am your host, Amber Stitt, and today we welcome back my friend, Kyle Christensen. How are you doing, Kyle? Doing great. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for inviting me back. Well, I'm always happy to have you back, and I don't want to play down your expertise, but I love the commonsensical approach that you have, which doesn't mean it's easy, but I always like hearing how you think about things because I feel like you bring a really good third party, and I say common sense, just like going back to the basics, keeping things simple and within our control. So I just love the topics that you bring. So I think today you're going to share a little bit about traditional approaches to planning. But, you know, I feel like we could even go more foundational just to begin with, go back in time, go back in time, at least 10 years for me, maybe 15 for you. I can't remember exactly when you got in the business, but if you're going to explain today about planning traditional versus kind of your concept, I think we could even tell the audience, what is financial planning? What is cash flow planning? Just kind of some of the vocabulary, because I think there's a lot of head nods with people, but I know when I got into the textbook studying, to me, it kind of when you're not sophisticated in this finance pseudo background, it can kind of all flow together. So maybe we start there and then we can roll into what are we seeing? What do, what did we grow up with and what's, what do we consider traditional? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I did, I started in 1999. So this is my 24th year uh, <laughs> this year. So, oh awesome. my gosh, time, time goes by fast, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I can speak pretty authoritatively about what traditional planning is. I'm a certified financial planner. I've been a certified financial planner since 2003. So I know what the traditional planning approach is, and I've seen it enough, right? I mean, I, it's just a constant beating drum out there. I like what you said. Like, it, it's a different language. And so it's important that your audience kind of knows what different things mean. And there's a lot of in- industry speak, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think if they don't know what th- certain things mean, then, then they don't know what they're getting into oftentimes. Yeah, it can be kind of exhausting. It almost it just, you can be very smart, but you don't feel that way. And that's where I think sometimes people just do nothing. I call it take action today with the Pathways audience. I'm always take some action today. And I know you talk about personal investing in in yourself and just treat their their homes and their personal lives like a business. Take it serious. It's your life. And you can do so many things within your control to be more successful and then financially free. It kind of starts within, but it doesn't feel good if you don't feel smart as you're trying to approach some of these basics. So I think you'll be helpful for the audience to really break it down. I always like hearing how you explain this approach. So financial planning maybe the traditional, I'll let you kind of take it from here and break it down. Yeah. I mean, so, so traditional planning is what I call the accumulation theory, right? And it's, and it's companion philosophy is something I call needs-based planning. So Mm -hmm. accumulation theory is essentially, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to have a nice job, and I'm going to set aside some of my money into retirement accounts over time. And supposedly, and we can talk more about this later, but supposedly the the money will compound in interest over time. And therefore, I need to get in as early as possible. And then at some point in time, hopefully by the time I want to retire, which normal retirement age, right, is 67 for us, for other people, if they were born in, you know, prior to 1960, that it might be an earlier date, you know, they're going to compound and they're going to build a nest egg. And I'm sure, again, industry speak, right? A retirement Mm -hmm. nest egg. Uh, What they're meaning by that is you're going to have an amount of money somewhere that supposedly you can live on the rest of your life, right? So And and you can stop working. Heap of money. It's going to be timeless in the sense that once you have that X factor, this is like always going to be the treasure trove that we have. And so we have to hit that goal and then we're safe, right? Yep. And there's a lot of predictions that go into that, right? And and financial planners might use really complex, uh, complicated software to try and figure that out, right? There's a ton of money that goes into financial planning software and uh, they'll do projections and they'll use historical rates of return and a lot of different scenarios. And they call that Monte Carlo simulations, right? So they'll, they'll go through, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of different scenarios to see what are your chances of success, you know, to reach your nest egg that you have to have in order to be able to retire 
and uh, provide for your needs. Now, the so, companion to that, oh, go ahead. I'll let you ask a question. <laughs> well, so Monte Carlo is almost like they're trying to say to the client or the um, yeah, we'll call it the client. With all of these assumptions, we're coming out with an average rate of su- success based upon historical. So it sounds really fancy and very technical to give you, you know, a really good idea. However, there's so many other factors that can go into it that we haven't even seen yet in our personal lives, especially with technology. We can't forecast some of these future events, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if we can learn one lesson from the pandemic. It's that we can't predict the future. Um, I mean, how many of those amazing scientific models were just totally wrong, like over and Mm -hmm. over again, Uh, projecting, you know, the rate of spread and how many people were going to die and all these kinds of things. I mean, they were just wrong over and over again. There's a really good economist that, that was kind of a mentor of mine. As I was getting started in the industry, his name is Bob Castellone. And Bob Castellone Mm -hmm. would say that there's only, only one thing right about all projections. And that's that they're all wrong. You know? <laughs> right. and, and and I love that. I mean, it's just a good like thing to keep in mind, right? The, the projections of the future, I'm not saying they don't have a use at all, but they're probably not going to be that way, right? Yeah. Um, well, I feel like scientists, back to what you're saying about the spread, it's like we understand they have to test things and they have to see how things play out in order to come to new information for, say, the community. So as they go through their testing, we're okay with the fact that, oops, you were wrong. Okay, here's the new thing. And we just kind of keep going with the flow. So it's, it's interesting that we do that every day that we're okay with getting new information and making adjustments. So if you apply that to what you're saying, we have to consider the fact that there's going to be things we we don't know about yet. Yeah. And I think that's really the purpose of planning. The purpose of planning is not to predict. The purpose of planning is to prepare Mm -hmm. um, and, and to adjust right? I just think of like a ship at sea, you know, if if we wanted to go from Fort Lauderdale to London, England, you know, um, we couldn't just set the rudder and expect to make make it to the destination, right? I mean, we couldn't just pick an average speed and make it to the destination. We actually have to turn the rudder, right? We have to make adjustments and there might be weather and there might be another Mm -hmm. ship that crosses in front, you know, we have to slow down, whatever, have to speed up, there's going to be things, and, and that's really how planning is, right? That's really how planning yeah. has to be. And, and think about, like, you know, the prediction of the amount of money that somebody needs to, in order to retire. What if you got on a ship and they said, you know what, we've calculated exactly the amount of fuel we need? Or you get mm-hmm. on an airplane to go somewhere. We've, we've calculated exactly, based on the averages, we've calculated exactly how much fuel we want on this plane and we don't have any more than that. So if any, if any of our predictions are wrong, then we're just, we're not going to make it. Would you still get on that plane? Would you still get on that ship? I mean, yeah, wouldn't. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of planes have been grounded for lots of reasons these days, post pandemic where they're just, there's all kinds of issues with logistics. I mean, that's evidence in itself that gosh, you buy that ticket, and you might not even be going, that's happening all the time lately, just with understaffing and other things that are happening. So yes. And so what you're saying is your planning is, oh, you're not going to start a plan, say this year, and it's going to last for the rest of your life. It has to, you have to keep evolving it. So I don't know if you've read Atomic Habits. I think you have. Mm -hmm. And so those of you that have, uh uh-huh. So anyone that wanted to just grab his information. He's got downloadable information on, online. I think jamesclear.com. But you're reminding me of the ice cube because if a frozen ice cube's on the table, I won't say it right, but you know, you're changing the temperature. Nothing's happening until it happens. And then whoosh, that's all water. So, or even there was a, a part about flying. And if you just change, just a, like mm-hmm. we're talking little, little changes and they're talking about going for good habits and building in great habits. But if you apply that to what you're saying, you're absolutely right that we can look at history. We can look at our historic. We, I mean, I know you read a ton about what other successful people have done. I know you do that. So you're not dismissing history, but you're saying we have to have a good reality check that we don't know what the future holds. So part of my pathways, five steps is to really build out and prepare while you're healthy and well, so that you can handle these obstacles that are coming. They are coming. We just don't know when and who in our team or family is going to be involved. But we want to have the ability to bounce back with a, hopefully a, as clear of a mind as possible, less stress and have some resilience. And so looking at it this way with your approach, I feel like that just, again, makes 
sense to me is that this goes back to the common sense kind of viewpoints here, even though it's not always easy to digest it because again, we're not trained growing yeah. up to think this yeah. way, right? Uh, and I, I think that people don't realize a really important factor, right? If I could tell your audience one thing, it would be that you are in a battle over the control and use of your money over your lifetime. You're in a battle. And, and if you don't know you're in a battle, then who's going to win? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> the people who know that they're in the battle. Right. And, and so you can't I plan people, for the, you can't yeah. sit among your map, like game of Thrones and look at your kingdom and say, how are we going to plan for <laughs> taking, yeah. you know, I mean, if, if you don't know you're in a competition, right. You don't know you're in a race, you're probably not yeah. going to win that race. Right. Yeah. And I think what people need to realize is look, we, Financial institutions are valuable, right? They provide really great products. They provide really great services, but they have a conflicting agenda. I was just reading last night in Warren Buffett's uh, biography, The Snowball, and he talks about like how when he first started doing uh, stock brokering, right? He didn't like it. He he <laughs> says, and I underlined in his book, he said, um, I realized there was a conflict of interest between what financial institutions wanted and mm-hmm. and my clients. So and I for think them that to be successful really and make money. That's right. Yeah, and and I think that's you know you look at traditional planning and and we just talked about what that essentially means, right? The, the accumulation theory and building up a nest egg and leaving your money in there. For a long time, I know, uh, I mean, if you are 30 years old, basically they're saying, look, we're going to, we want to hold on to your money until you're 67, right? So 37 years, more than three decades. I think we have to look at things and say, why has the financial industry adopted this philosophy so, so much wholeheartedly, right? They're all in on the accumulation theory. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that battle, right? Over who's going to have control and use of your money. And you know, who's promoting the accumulation theory? It's really the financial industry. And they're saying, look, the best thing you can do is just give us your money and let us hold on to it for decades. I've been a part of some study groups with you, other strategic partners and people that you affiliate with. And this is such a good discussion. And I know you do a great job talking through a lot of this. And so really building that application to really help people see kind of the timeline here and how long do you have to go? And I think we always think the compounding nature always sounds great, but if we, if we bring it to light this way, I think it makes perfect sense that we really have to look at where our dollars are going. And I know you teach a lot about opportunity costs. And again, we can leverage with utilizing our credit scores or debt or the banking products as needed, but we also have to have, the goal would be to have more control and not have decades go by of just not having access. And I think that's mm-hmm. part of one of the things that's really valuable for, for what you teach is where's your money and do you do you have any rights to it in the interim to help yeah. you know build out some passive income strategies, have some liquidity? I don't know if you want to close with maybe talking a little bit about that and just maybe something for them to think about. Yeah. Ultimately, I think people want to be financially free. There's a difference between retirement and financial freedom. But financial freedom is having sufficient income from assets, right? That you can support your chosen lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. And if you, if you give up control and use of your money, you're also giving up cash flow. You're not getting mm-hmm. any cash flow during that 37 years that you're supposedly compounding and building your nest egg. You're getting no cash flow. Well, that means you can't become financially free during that time frame, right? Right. So, right. so people who are choosing that path of, Hey, I'm going to put my money into something that I can't touch for 30 years. They're saying I can't get cash flow either for 30 years. And then, and for the most part, people are also investing that money in things that they don't understand. They have zero control over the outcome, no influence over the outcome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a reason for that. We could probably have a whole podcast just about the natural oh, tendencies will. of people, yep. you know, and yep. how that hurts them long term when it comes to money. So traditional planning focuses on, you know, you giving up control of your money to financial institutions for long periods of time. They're getting cash flow. They wouldn't wait 30 years, right, to get cash flow from from oh, whatever yeah, they they're put using their money, money to all day, right every now. day to do other things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and that's exactly kind of, right. Why shouldn't we have access to that uh, combination of, um, 
you know, having that control. So I really appreciate it, Kyle. And we will have more episodes digging into some of these, we'll call them steps or principles. I mean, we, we can always say principles, of course, given your foundation and what you teach. So I really appreciate you being here again. And thank you for the audience also as well. And we'll link up all your information as I do in the description boxes so people can find you. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of The Amber Stitch Show. For more information about the podcast, books, articles, and more, please visit me at amberstitt.com. Until next week, enjoy your journey at home and at work. Thank you for listening.